So I want to talk to you about teaching tools in plant biology, but I thought before I specifically focus on that uh, aspect of outreach that we're doing with the ASPB, I wanted to, uh, to sort of frame this around the question of this is a new group of plant scientists, a new UK Plant Science Federation, and I think it's really important when you're starting as a new professional society to, to think what kinds of education and outreach programs does the society want to support and put its limited resources into? So we've heard some excellent um, things that are going on in the UK, and I think you know, there's a lot to choose from. So making these kind, learning about what's going on and making uh, informed decisions about how to go about supporting uh, education and outreach is a really big challenge for this group. Um, I've been involved with the American Society of Plant Biologists since I started my postdoc more than 20 years ago. And initially, I was involved as a, a sort of volunteer scientist, as many people are with professional societies. They have a, a day job, and then they do little things on the side. But in the last uh, few years, I've been uh, of working on the, this new project, the Teaching Tools in Plant Biology. But through the 20 years of my involvement with ASPB, I've participated in just about every kind of education and outreach program that it's involved in. So I thought I'd give you a, a quick little overview of what ASPB does as a professional society to help you think about what this society can do. Um, so ASPB is a professional society. It's also a not-for-profit scientific publisher. Uh, ASPB has about 5,000 members, and about 40% of them are resident outside the United States. Uh, the journals we publish are The Plant Cell and Plant Physiology. Um, and I, I don't know if you can see it on the logo, but uh, ASPB was founded in 1924. Actually, it used to be the American Society of Plant Physiologists, but then we changed to ASPB a, about 20 years ago. Uh, it says, don't be fooled by the name. Um, the American Society of Plant Biologists, which publishes Plant Cell and Plant Physiology, I'm sure you all know Kathy Martin, who's editor-in-chief of The Plant Cell, is based here in Norwich. And then starting next year, uh, Mike Blatt will be the editor-in-chief of Plant Physiology, and he's based in Glasgow, and I'm also based in Glasgow. So uh, don't be fooled by the name. It's the ASPB, but it's, it's really an international organization. Um, as an aside, you know, we, we will always be the ASPB because one of the things we do is we lobby the American government to continue supporting funds. So being the American Society of Plant Biologists has a bit more impact uh, for that purpose. So the revenue for the society largely comes from membership and the institutional subscriptions to the journals. And much of the money that comes in goes back to support membership in various ways and, of course, to produce the journals. Um, and the little bit that's left over, most of that goes into uh, education and outreach programs. So one of the things that ASPB does very well as a professional society is to take its members, the professional scientists, and help them find opportunities to interact with uh, the general public or students or you know, politicians, various groups that they may not be able to connect with otherwise. And again, that's a nice way for you to think about this group functioning as a conduit to bring scientists into various venues. One of the things we enjoy doing is going to things like the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, has a Family Science Day every year in conjunction with its annual meeting. And right now there's the UK, uh, I'm sorry, United States um, Science and Engineering Festival going on. And so these are big national um, public science events that we participate in. And one of the things we like to do is um, make what we call lily put gardens. You can see the little girl here is wearing one. Where's my mouse? There we go. So it's just a little cup with some holes in it and some string, and you put some dirt in it, and you can put anything from moss to a seed to a kalanchoe seedling, and then they take them home. So little things that give kids an opportunity to touch plants and have a plant pet are very effective uh, ways to do this. And, and it's a win-win situation because taking a scientist out of the lab and putting them in front of a person who doesn't know anything about science, science and letting them, them interact with them is, is in, tremendously rewarding to the scientist. So whenever we do these, we recruit people to help out and they say, God, that was the best day I've spent in years because it's so energizing to, to talk to people one-on-one -on -one about science, even if it's only about little plastic cups. Another thing we do a lot of, uh, Ginny mentioned the, 
the 12 principles. Um, we develop materials for K-12, our primary and secondary teachers. Um, one of the things we've been doing is called the 12 principles of plant biology, and we've recently done a, a set of inquiry-based labs based on the 12 principles of plant biology. We have lots of flyers and handouts that we give to teachers. They're available as PDFs on our website. But we also go to teacher conferences. So there's the National Association of Biology Teachers, and there's the uh, National Science Teacher Association Conference. So we bring a big booth with lots of volunteers, and we do hands-on activities with the teachers. We give them everything from uh, make a DNA family tree, or make a family tree using DNA. Um, Genes in your genes about cotton and BT. Uh, and there's one more in here, but I can't find it. We also have bookmarks. If you've done anything with ASPB, you may have seen the, the famous bookmarks, um, which are very lovely things. And we've redesigned them. These are the actual, the old ones. But um, And if you give these to teachers, they can hand them out in the classroom for students. For, uh, they're all about little facts about plant biology. So lots of various uh, projects that ASPB has been doing successfully for quite some time. Um, a lot of our effort also goes into higher education. And one of the reasons for that is because most of our members are employed in higher education. And so it's, it's sort of a service to the members to help support them in their teaching needs. Um, some of the things we do there, the uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology of Plants textbook was published by ASPB. Um, we have a grants program that is, gives a little bit of seed money to people developing new curricular ideas. Um, we have a summer undergraduate research fellowship uh, that funds, uh, I think, about a dozen students to work for 10 weeks during the summer with a scientist mentor. At our annual conferences, we have lots of activities to support uh, higher education, everything from workshops, demonstrations, exhibitions, and networking, which is a very important uh, role that a society can do, is bringing people together to talk about education. And I highlighted workshops because I have to remember to say something about it again at the end. So higher education is my area of expertise, and uh, that's what I'll, I'll talk about for the next little bit. Um, higher education, as you know, has some inherent challenges to it. Um, probably the main one that everyone would, would tick if we had a, a list of what are the things that you find challenging about your job is the lack of time. Uh, there's just Our jobs are not designed to, um, to give us enough hours in the day to do all the different tasks we're asked to do. Another major problem, um, and I think this is probably even worse in the UK than in the US, is there's, there seems to be a lack of institutional support and incentives for teaching uh, at the undergraduate level. Um, if institutions are being evaluated and compared on the research output, what's the incentive for the university to support teaching? Um, I think it'll be very interesting in the next few years to see whether the, the English tuition fee implementation is going to affect the way the universities sort of see their roles and evaluate themselves. Granting agencies also can help to support education. And again, one of the things we've learned in the US is that when the National Science Foundation started demanding uh, evidence that its grantees were using some of the funds to promote education, uh, there, there was a real um, increase in the level of attention that uh, scientists started giving to what education was and how they could do it better. So I know that there is a little bit of uh, uh, a line in which you know, UK scientists have to describe how they're, the broader impacts of their research. But I think that could be enforced maybe a bit more to help incentivize uh, teaching uh, in the university level. Uh, we're fortunate in that our discipline is very active. Um, but of course, that makes teaching challenging, because last year's lecture is already obsolete, and the textbook that you're using is several years obsolete. Um, so when you're preparing to talk to students about science, you, you have this, this issue of a gap between you know, what you've prepared and, and what the state is right now. There's also universally a, a real lack of training, mentoring, and community for people at the higher education level of teaching. Um, and finally, this is a, an interesting one, which is that the way people think and learn and access information is changing. So 
teaching the way I was taught is no longer very effective. Not only have the students changed, but we've also learned a lot more about teaching and learning and what is effective and what isn't effective. So we've got a, a sort of lot of very big challenges um, in higher education uh, that, that we need to address. So um, the Teaching Tools Project is an effort to try and address some of these higher education challenges. Teaching Tools in Plant Biology is a, uh, a feature of the plant cell, so it's actually part of the scholarly journal, The Plant Cell. Um, so it makes it a bit different than, than some of the other um, educational tools that are out there. Um, the articles that we create are maintained um, and up to date by an annual revision. We've been doing this for about two and a half years now, so we've revised some of these twice now already, but they're continually revised. They're peer reviewed. Um, the content is completely derived from research, so we have this great um, body of, uh, of information and we extract uh, from the primary literature into creating educational materials. And then the, the scholarship of teaching and learning really um, is pervasive throughout the way we create the materials. We want these to be uh, successful pedagogically um, as well as scientifically. And people always say, how do I find them? And the easiest way to find them is if you go to either Plant Cell or Plant Physiology homepage and you just click on the logo, it takes you to the, the resource. Um, what each teaching tool is, is three pieces. Um, it's a review article, which is written for undergraduates. Um, so it's got a minimum of uh, unfamiliar jargon. And um, you'll notice it has no inline citations. And it's just because students aren't really that used to sort of skipping over the citation in the middle of the paragraph. So the citations are at the end, and they're hyperlinked um, to the articles themselves. They also uh, include a set of PowerPoint slides, which I'll describe further in a second, um, that are custom made um, to match up with the review articles. And they also have, each one has a teaching guide, and the teaching guide includes um, key concepts uh, about the, the topic, um, discussion questions. So some people really like to lecture and lecture only. Some people like to lecture for 10 minutes and then throw a challenging question to the students and have the students grapple with it. Some people don't lecture at all and only have the students you know, report back on their own research about a different topic. So there's lots of different ways to teach. And so we try and support all the different teaching styles through these teaching guides. Uh, all the topics we've created to date, um, we did a set on leaf development. Uh, we've done epigenetics and small RNA. Most of these topics are geared at upper level undergraduates. Um, so they're sort of specialists like Philotax here or something. But we also have a set that we're creating um, that are appropriate in topic and in level to give to a general audience, either a high school audience or um, a community group. Um, I've given the genetic improvements in agriculture talk, I've given to several groups of retired <laughs> professionals, and they're a great group to teach. You know, they're, uh, they're highly engaged and, and very interested in, in expanding their mind. They'd be the perfect undergraduates if they weren't in their 70s. Um, but that's a particularly interesting uh, lecture because the things we, we heard about this morning with the challenges that we face in terms of our uh, global environment and food production are, are sort of introduced in a very safe way, including what is GM and you know, what does it do and, and, and should you be afraid of it sort of questions. So that's a, a fun one to give. Plants are not alone is another one that's very interesting because it's sort of an unfamiliar idea to people that plants interact with other organisms besides just being eaten. Um, they're more active than that. And then the one that we've got coming out uh, at the end of this month, Plants, Food, and Human Health, is, is very exciting because we look at the, the, the rise in chronic diseases and what is the connection between plant science and chronic diseases. And then later we'll have one on biofuels coming out probably at the end of the year. So concepts that, that maybe the public needs to hear more about from scientists. We've also been working through themes of lectures. So we've done an entire theme on the hormones. Um, and I've got little postcards I'll put out by the coffee if you want a reminder uh, of what the hormones are. But we've got a, a lecture on each hormone. 
We've also got a theme on plants are not alone. Um, we've got the general lecture, but then we've got more detailed lectures on each of the different kinds of interactions that plants are involved in. And uh, after we finish the plants are not alone module, we're going to tackle the, um, the sort of core of plant physiology. So this is something people have been asking us to do for a while. So we're going to do the, 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 the nuts and bolts of, of plant physiology will be our, our next theme. Um, so I want to talk for the last couple minutes about what these slides are. Um, so the slides are sets that include um, basic and advanced material. Um, and the idea is that if you're going to talk to um, uh, uh, first year students in a, in a general biology course about a topic, or students in their third year about a topic, you're going to present different material. So you can pick and choose how you want to present the material. So we, we call this the buffet model of, um, of slides. But they're, they're presented in a, um, a coherent story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And uh, so this is something that we've found a lot of postdocs are reading these as um, review articles, sort of visual review articles, or as I like to call it, the, uh, the graphic novel of science. So you sit down and read through the slides and you get pictures instead of just words. Um, we don't lock these or in any way restrict them so you can pick out bits and pieces or you can translate them. It looks like a postscript error, but it's actually translated into Russian, you know, and a lot of our users don't teach in English. So they pull out the slides and then just rewrite the text in their own language. Which reminds me that I think this is a very interesting point, which I wasn't even aware of until a couple of years ago. But um, through the Agora program, which is Access to Global Online Research in Agriculture, Scholarly journals are provided at no cost or at almost no cost to countries whose GDP is uh, per capita is below a certain level. So we're preparing these um, materials and sort of envisioning them being used in universities. And what we're finding is that um, they're being used in universities in developing countries that where um, students don't have access to textbooks. So you know, it makes, it's a nice sort of icing on the cake for someone in the US, but for someone in, in Ghana, it can really be a, a huge uh, resource available to them. And I, I just think that's an interesting aside that um, you know, it's, it's a publicly available um, piece of uh, work that uh, you can get in developing countries without any um, subscription to the plant cell. Oops. Okay. Four of the things that we try and uh, incorporate into the, the design of the slides. The first one is that slides should be very image centric. So the slides tell the story through pictures and the words have a supporting role. Um, so here you can see our, uh, our fuel and our our nitrogen and our fixation and our plants graphically described. So they're, they're very pretty, I think. Um, another thing is, is that when we're teaching students about science, we have to really make sure that they're learning about the process of science. And in biology, that's empirical studies and experimentations. So although we like to present the model, this is how a cell works, we also present some of the key experiments that have helped us to understand how a cell works. But we have to present it in a way that, that an undergraduate can understand. So we have to you know, often deconstruct the experiment to, to explain why are there three bands on an immunoprecipitation? What's that all about? Well, two of them are the immunoglobulin, that kind of thing. Or draw pictures of a, a study, you know, explaining what a grafting study means. Um, another thing that I think is really probably the most important thing that we as teachers have to do is to connect science with the, the society around us. And it seems obvious, you know, that it's there's so many important issues that plant scientists work on, um, but it, it, it doesn't always come across to the students that plant science is is extremely uh, relevant to their world. So we connect pl plant science to everything from chronic diseases and obesity to to pollinators, and that's a varroa mite on the bee. And, uh, and then, of course, plant science and how plant scientists are addressing things like climate change. And then finally, uh, science is a process. You know, our snapshot of how a cell works came from a historical background that was a different set of ideas. So we've got you know, the idea that diseases can be caused by microorganisms, the elegant studies to look at um, oxen and its structure and uh, movement. 
And then one of the most important things also as educators is to um, not just tell students the answers, but to inspire them to ask their own questions. So we incorporate some unknowns in the fields. What, what do we not know uh, is an important message to give to students. And again, we reinforce it in the teaching guide with lots and lots of questions for the students to, to wonder about, how would you figure this out sort of questions. Um, we uh, are also, uh, Ginny mentioned something about plants in the news. We have a little bulletin board um, where we just pop up, you know, exciting papers. Here's Kathy Martin here. I want to mention that this was, this idea of teaching tools really came from Kathy and she's shepherded it along and gotten it funded. So um, she couldn't be here, but, uh, uh, so if you have any hot topics, it's called Hooks and Hot Topics for University Teachers and Students. If you have any hot topics you'd like to share, um, send them to me and I'll post them. And then the last thing I want to say is, um, we also try and support higher education um, through uh, working with graduate students and postdocs and helping them start thinking about how to teach. And so we do, we run, we, we run workshops at scientific conferences. Um, so if, if you know any students or postdocs coming to any of these meetings, um, have them come along to the workshops. They're highly interactive. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we want stu them to start thinking about how to teach before they're actually in front of the students desperately wondering how they're going to survive their teaching rota. So hopefully that's given you a few ideas of some of the ways that um, you know, ASPB is tackling some of the, the issues of uh, teaching and plant science. A couple of ideas that occurred to me um, that, that this group should consider is really, um, I think, the role of the society, professional society, as a conduit to connect scientists and the public. Um, providing a forum, we've, I've heard about so many different ideas all over the UK. UK plant science can provide a place that people can share their ideas both virtually and also by bringing people together in a forum to share their ideas and discuss them with each other. So that's it from me. Thanks. Thanks.